So Gatorade is famous for its slogan, the thirst quencher. And it's a good slogan, right? Because it, it, it's, it's short, it's simple, and it gets its point across. And, and it speaks to all of us in some ways because, you know what, I, I would bet that all of us have had a moment, at least one, probably a lot, where we've done some hard work. We come inside and, and we're hot and we're sweaty and we're thirsty. And so you get that first sip that nice, cool glass of water or beverage of your choice. And there's something about it, isn't there? That, that first thirst-quenching sip. It's like, ah, it's so good. It's amusing to, for me to see how I think it's going, ah, it's just something we all do. Because I don't think I taught my boys to do it, but every now and then they're thirsty. And you're, mm, ah. And you know satisfaction. It speaks across all language barriers because everybody gets thirsty. In fact, I think it's because of the fact that thirst is such a universal trait that the Bible actually often talks about the idea of thirst to describe our spirit's need of God. Like like our spirits are just longing for this spiritual thirst to be quenched. And that can only be done by the presence of God. We're in the middle of of our Lenten series that we're calling Boot Camp for the Soul. And it's it's all about getting our, our spirits into shape during the season of Lent. It's about turning over a new leaf spiritually. And so the first week, we talked about how if you're, if you're starting something new, whenever you start something, there's always that temptation to quit. And so how we, we push through that temptation. Last week, we talked about how if you're running drills like, like a stopwatch, you need to hit that reset button to take that hand all the way back to zero so you can have a new try. There are ways that all of us have faltered and fallen, and we need that new try from time to time. And that's part of it as well. And today, we're talking about the bodies. And more importantly, the spirits need to stay hydrated. That is, to drink in the living water that only Jesus offers. Because you know what? You're going to need to take some time in the midst of this boot camp for your soul to satisfy your spiritual thirst. Much like someone who's actually running drills, they're not going to make it very long if they don't get some water. And so our gospel lesson today is one that... Uh, where Jesus himself is experiencing thirst. And so he strikes up a conversation with this woman, the Samaritan woman at a well, and they have this short conversation that talks about so much, talks about water and about thirst. And because it's Jesus, he has this way of guiding it around to talk about eternal life. And so our reading this morning, it's from John's Gospel, the fourth chapter, verses 5 to 14. And you have an insert in your bulletin, uh, but as we now come to God, let's pray. Uh, Holy God, we do thank you so much, Lord, for you, for your spirit, for the way that you move. Lord, we pray that, that your spirit would now be abundantly here and present with us. God, we pray that, that we would seek, seek you with all that we are, and that in seeking, we would find you. We pray, God, that your spirit would quench our thirst that you would teach us how to lean on you, that we can learn how to be satisfied by you and you alone. Holy Spirit, be here. Minister to us. I ask that these words will be your words, God, your message for your people, spoken out of your great love. And if anything I say, God, is not from you, then let that just fall away. But everything that's from you, God, plant that deeply inside us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So beginning at verse 5. Jesus came to the Samaritan village of Sychar, near the field that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired from the long walk, sat wearily beside the well about noontime. Soon a Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Please give me a drink. 
He was alone at the time because his disciples had gone into the village to buy some food. The woman was surprised, for Jews refused to have anything to do with Samaritans. She said to Jesus, you are a Jew and I'm a Samaritan woman. Why are you asking me for a drink? Jesus replied, if you only knew the gift God has for you and who you are speaking to, you would ask me and I would give you living water. But sir, you don't have a rope or a bucket, she said, and this well is very deep. Where would you get this living water? And besides, do you think you're greater than our ancestor Jacob who gave us this well? How can you offer better water than he and his sons and his animals enjoyed? Jesus replied, anyone who drinks this water will soon become thirsty again. But those who drink the water I give will never be thirsty again. It becomes a fresh bubbling spring within them, giving eternal life. So Jesus came to a Samaritan village. Now already the text is trying to let you know a few things that, that maybe you didn't realize, but the people at Jesus' time would have definitely known. And it was simply this. Jews and Samaritans did not get along. They had an ancient beef with one another, going back more than 500 years at this point. And basically what it came down to was who was God's chosen people really, who worshipped him the proper ways, and there's a lot of dynamics happening. But the region known as Samaria, it's pretty much like in the, the center of Israel. And north of Samaria was Galilee, so like the region that Jesus is from, and south is Jerusalem. And so if you were wanting to go from Galilee in the north to Jerusalem in the south, you either had to take this long detour or you had to go through Samaria and be in the presence of Samaritans. Jews would go around. They just didn't go through Samaria. But this time, Jesus did. And this is shocking and surprising to the Samaritan woman. Now, even more unusual would actually be the fact that here Jesus is at noontime, a woman is coming to get water at this point in the day. And Jesus struck up a conversation with her. You see, at this time, Jews, proper Jews at least, did not speak to women, I should say Jewish men, did not speak to women in public. There is even a record of note saying that husbands, if they really wanted to be good observant Jews, would not even speak to their wives in public. Such was the social class distinction. And so let's look at what's happening here. Jesus... He's gone into the land of Samaria. He's hungry. He's tired. He's thirsty. And he actually speaks to a woman in public. And not just any woman, but a Samaritan woman. And clearly, if you look at the text, you can see she's surprised by this. She basically just says, you know who I am, right? And you know who you are. You know I'm a Samaritan and you're a Jew and Jews don't have anything to do with Samaritans. But Jesus is actually already doing more in this conversation than she realizes. You see, because he had said to her, that's how he started the conversation, in fact. He asked if she could get him something to drink because he's at this deep well. And he doesn't have a bucket and he doesn't have a rope. And so he actually tells her when she questions him, you know who I am. He says, if you knew who I was, you would ask me for water and I would give you living water, which means, by the way, they describe living water as like moving water. You know, moving water is always better than still water. It's always tastes better. It's cleaner. It's fresher. And so then she takes him really literally. She says, sir, and I almost feel like she could be like, you're, you're clearly dense or you're mistaken. She's like, sir, you don't even have a bucket much less rope that's going to extend down a hundred feet, which, by the way, is how deep Jacob's well was, a hundred feet into this water. So please, by all means, if you have some other water, then sure, I would love that. I would, I would love where to know where you're going to get this, this running, living water from. And by the way, do you think that you're better than our ancestor Jacob? Is that what you think? This is Jesus, y'all. So, yeah. 
Yeah, Jesus, Jesus is greater than their ancestor Jacob is. Now, Jesus talks about then, he says, you know what, if, if you drank the water I gave you, that water, that living water, it would come to live inside you. And it would, it would bubble up into this spring that would give you eternal life and you would never even need to drink again. It's quite the promise. Now you could say that because of that, Jesus is actually like the real, true thirst quencher. He says that when you seek him and you seek the living water that he gives, your spirit is satisfied in a way unlike anything else ever could satisfy your spirit. In other words, Jesus is the answer to the thirst that numerous Old Testament writers have spoken of. There are a lot of references in the Old Testament that talk about, about food and, and water and use those, those ideas of hunger and thirst to express our need for God. But one of my favorites, and one that, that I don't think we really hear, but I want us to hear today, is from Psalm 42. Now, Psalm 42 has this line that says, as the deer pants for streams of living water, so my, my soul pants for you, O oh God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. See, I think when we hear that, we, we have this tendency to envision like this beautiful deer. And we see the deer coming over in the peaceful and quiet meadow and, and bending down gently and, and drinking water from a stream. And we say like, that's what my soul is like, God. My soul is like that, the way that deer wanted that water. That's, that's how I want you. And, and it becomes beautiful and maybe even a little bit cutesy. In fact, I first knew this psalm from a song that we sing about it that I think in some ways maybe even kind of conveys that image some. But if you know anything about deer... Technically, it's a heart beast, but we translate it deer because we don't have heart beast. But if you know anything about those sorts of, of animals, you know that by the time they're panting for water, they're in bad shape. This is not a, a casual thirst that says, I could, I could have a drink. Sure, why not? I'd love to have a glass of water. This is like tongue hanging out near the point of death. If I don't get water soon, something's going to happen here that will not be good. And the psalmist says the same way that that, that, that deer, it just pants and it yearns for water. God, that's what my soul feels like. He says, my soul, it's like it's dying if I don't encounter you. That's how much I need you, God. The same way that that deer pants, that's how I need you. Like if something doesn't happen soon, God, I'm going to die. I, th I think in some ways it can perhaps be hard for us to appreciate the type of desperation that the psalmist is talking about because I don't know if we really know thirst the way that some of these folks knew thirst. I mean, Israel, it's a dry and arid region. They have a couple of brief rainy seasons, but it's, for the most part, a dry and arid region. And if you found water, then that water was life, and you hung on to it. But even still, waters can be inconsistent. Waters dry up at the end of rainy seasons, and waters get replenished. But all of these folks would have known a need for water in a way that I don't know if we do, because obviously, they didn't, they didn't have faucets, they didn't have pipes, that goes without saying, but you know what else they didn't have? They didn't have amazing mountain rivers and streams and the quantity and quality that we do. And so they knew thirst and they knew how powerful, how powerful the body says you need to get something to drink when you are truly, truly panting. I thought I knew thirst actually, in my own life. I thought I knew thirst because I, I played sports through high school and just running around as a kid and who hydrates properly? I and mean, very few of us actually drink our eight glasses of water a day. I thought I knew thirst until that year that I was a missionary in Kenya. And some friends and I, we went hiking through a, a national park called Hell's Gate. Now, as I'm getting there, we're riding bicycles from the room we had rented until, into the park and that park was a dry and arid park. And Kenya also has rainy seasons, two of them, the big rains and the small rains. And this time, it just happened to be towards the end 
of the, small, or the, of the dry season before we're waiting for the small rains to come. And so everything was a bit drier than usual. So riding our bicycles in, have a backpack on, a Nalgene bottle in there, and I didn't realize I didn't screw that lid on as tightly as I should have. And something about the way the backpack bounced against my back just gently, little bit by little bit, opened up that water bottle till eventually all of it dumped out. And I wasn't that worried, though, because I was like, well, the park's office, they're bound to have some water for sale. We get there, they don't. They have soda. They have Sprite. And hey, you know what? I was 25. How many of you were maybe a little stupid when you were 25? You thought you could maybe do a little bit more than maybe you could. And I said, you know what? Hey, I'm going to get two Sprites. I'll be fine, guys. Let's go. No reason to cancel today's hike for me. Fast forward two hours. Those Sprites are long gone. And you know what? They didn't satisfy my thirst. In fact, they made it worse. And so at this point, we're far away from everything. I am in bad shape, dehydrated, splitting headache. My tongue has begun to swell a little bit. Now, my friends, they're sharing water with me, but, but just a little, because they need it too. And I began to realize, I, I might be in trouble here. And so I stopped talking or doing any of the things I normally do as the body just takes over longing for something to drink. We came to these, these hot springs, and I was overjoyed, hot springs, and I, I took my Nalgene bottle, and I started filling it up a little bit, and the smell of sulfur was apparent, but even still, I was in such bad shape. I was going to drink, but my friends were pretty convincing that I would die if I did, and so I didn't, but that's how desperate I was. And I'm telling you something, this story is not exaggerated for effect in any way, shape, or form. I'm actually leaving out a couple of things that I probably could talk about. But you know what saved me? And I look at it as a miracle, I really do. It started to rain in the midst of the dry season. It wasn't forecast, it wasn't supposed to happen, but it didn't just rain a little. It was like this amazing downpour. And it was so hard that we're actually having to take shelter under this little cliff face because it's raining that hard. And meanwhile, water is just draining down, filtering over the rocks. And I'm like sticking my head out, like trying to drink some. I'm my Nalgene bottle and I'm, I'm getting this amazing water, some of the best tasting water I've ever had. And that water saved me, gave me energy and let me continue on. You know, the people in Israel would have all known thirst like that at some point. And that's why the Bible talks about God like water and equates our spiritual need for him with our physical thirst. And once again, this isn't a, I feel like I'm a little thirsty and I could have a drink kind of need. We need God in that desperate way that says, if I don't get something soon, I'm going to be in trouble. And so here to this, Jesus says that he is the source of, of true living water. And that if you drink of him, there's this, he says it's like there's a spring that's living inside of you that bubbles up to eternal life. And this is a grand promise, and it's one that we very much need. But I wonder about the best way to hydrate. I mean, that's, that's the title of today's message, Hydrate. I've observed in my life that God created us and a lot of his creation in ways that teach us deeper truths about our spirits, that teach us deeper truths about himself. I think maybe that's why we can talk about the fact that the created order, even though it's fallen, it is still essentially good and it is still God's. I think about land. Have you ever seen dry parched land? And, and what it's like in the midst of a drought. And do you know the best way for land to absorb water isn't for the floods to come in at that point, but it's, but it's the bit of a drizzle that, that just sort of softens that hard ground that's become like stone to the point that it can then take in more rain and more life-giving water. I wonder if 
there are times when our hearts are that way too. If like maybe you hear this now and you think, I could use some of that living water. It's been a while. I don't feel as close to God as I used to and I want to. Or maybe there's moments where we desperately come to God and we wonder where God is and why God isn't answering our prayers. And maybe we're like that parched ground sometimes. And the best way, and God knows this, the best way for us wouldn't be the immediate downpour dousing of his spirit, but the trickle, the little bit that gently stirs things and softens our hearts and awakens something within us that makes us aware of our deep need and thirst for him. And God, and maybe God in his wisdom does that. Maybe the best way for us to hydrate is the same way that we stay best hydrated throughout the day, and that's a little bit at a time throughout the day. I have this tendency to suddenly, as I'm going to bed, realize I'm really thirsty, and then I drink a few glasses of water, and that doesn't work. It puts liquid in you, but it doesn't really help with your hydration. But what helps, if you want to be best hydrated, is is to drink a little bit throughout the day, even if you don't realize you're thirsty yet. And maybe spiritually, it's the same way. I mean, there's something to be said, of course, for those intense moments of seeking God for long, dedicated hours, but maybe the best spiritual practices are the ones that say... I'm going to pray just at little points throughout the day. I'll spend time musing over God, a little bit of Bible study here, a little bit of time of of randomly serving someone that God puts in my path here, maybe a little short time of, of meditation and fasting. And basically, I think what we do is we just keep Jesus at the forefront of our minds throughout the entire day. And we don't just relegate him to to this one accepted time, either before meals or when you get up or when you go to sleep, but you just let Jesus be a part of your life all day long. You keep Jesus at the forefront of your thoughts all day long. And, And maybe that's the way to keep our spirits best hydrated, that little bit at a time so that when we're in need of the big moments, our hearts are already softened and we know the presence of God and we can receive it best. Maybe that's the best way to go about it, our hydration and our boot camp for the soul. So taste. Taste uh, of Jesus' living water and drink throughout the day. Listen, Listen to God and follow. Pray and discern, give and act. And in so doing, allow the living Christ to dwell richly within you like the spring that bubbles up giving eternal life. And hopefully God's spirit can be poured so, so greatly and so richly into our hearts that the overflow of that will pour out into all our relationships, all our encounters, into everything that we are. To God be the glory. Amen.